So today we have the pleasure of speaking with someone that truly needs no introduction. One of the top lawyers in the world in the field of intellectual property at a very early age, he made a big career shift a few years back, ended up working at Enchain, and shortly after moving to Enchain, became the company CEO. We, of course, are speaking about Jimmy Wynn, currently president of the Bitcoin Association and one of the leading faces of the Bitcoin SV community. Jimmy, it's our honor to have you on Unbounded Conversations today. Welcome. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here and be unbounded with you both. <laughs> so we'd love to learn more about your professional background that kind of led you to kind of joining Enchain and then eventually becoming the CEO. And really, you know, feel free to share with us the the nitty gritty of like uh, what it was like to be an IP lawyer and and how that prepared you uniquely for the work that Enchain is doing. Sure. So as most people know, I was a lawyer for about 21 years um, before I left to join the full-time Bitcoin and blockchain world. So I was a lawyer and then partner in those big corporate law firms that um, represent significant businesses, multinationals, as well as you know, emerging startups. And when I came out of law school, it was 1995 mid-1990s. So for those of you out there who are old enough to remember it, that's when the internet boom was happening. A lot of dot-coms were emerging. And, you know, I was an ambitious young lawyer. I'd always been, you know, ambitious as a, as a youngster. I graduated law school at 22, so you're always wanting to figure out, well, what am I going to do that stands out? And I decided at the time to explore this whole world of the internet and digital technology and become a new media and new digital technology lawyer. Um, because particularly in Los Angeles where I was practicing, the entertainment media industry is very large. Um, and they were all kind of scared of this internet thing at the time, right? It's kind of like how people feel about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology today. They're not really sure what to make of it. Um, so I decided to focus on that and it defined the course of my career. Um, so I started focusing on intellectual property matters, particularly copyright, trademark, some patent matters, uniquely focused on internet and then as the internet moved into other digital areas, different kinds of digital technologies, like social media and mobile uh, and a whole variety of other things. Um, so my clients uh, over the course of my career ended up everything from the major businesses like Amazon, Microsoft, Uber, a lot of the major motion picture studios. I represented the Motion Picture Association of America, Major League Baseball Properties, the Miss Universe Organization, one of my most fun famous clients, um, and uh, a lot of tech startups as well. And as a tech lawyer, you're always having to learn and keep up to date with the next new fields of technology, right? Technology changes very quickly. So I didn't really plan to find Bitcoin. I always say it sort of found me. Um, some of my clients were in the online gaming space, as well as in fintech. And some of them started exploring Bitcoin and virtual currency when it surfaced in, you know, uh, after 2009. I think I first started paying attention to Bitcoin around 2011, 2012. Um, some of my clients wanted to explore virtual currency options to make international remittance more efficient, cheaper. Mm -hmm. Um, I had some online game clients that wanted to explore use of virtual currencies in their online games. And um, some of my online game clients use it for a payment alternative. So that's when I started paying attention to it. And so is this early Bitcoin? Was this ICO cryptocurrency or what, what era of the you know, past 10 years did you enter? Um, so I think I started working with uh, on behalf of my clients when I was in private practice in Bitcoin virtual currency related issues, probably around 2012 or 2013. This was before the ICO craze had hit. Um, people were trying to figure out how Bitcoin fit into legal and regulatory situations. I think people started exploring uh, their virtual currency uh, systems, none that I would say were super successful. Um, some of my clients in the online game space wanted to figure out how they could create their own type of virtual coin, token, currency that wasn't necessarily sold um, in the outside world, but just used in-game. Um, so that I would say around 2012 and 2013, um, one of my clients um, in Canada was a fintech business. They actually had my firm uh, and I work on a series of patent applications that they, uh, that they filed related to a virtual currency system that they wanted to invent. Um, and so I sort of, you know, got drugged into it by clients um, and learned, you know, a decent amount about it. Looking back in hindsight, you know, what I thought I knew about Bitcoin and virtual currency then was so tiny <laughs> compared right. to, you know, what I've had to learn since then. Um, it was around the same time that I knew I was 
probably destined to leave the legal career. It had been really good to me, but I, if I'm really honest, was starting to get bored. You know, I had a very successful career by all accounts. I had risen to equity partner at a number of major, you know, corporate law firms, was, you know, practice and industry leaders, uh, was chair in the State Bar of California's IP law section at one point in time, and had risen to, you know, a fair degree of uh, prominence in the legal industry. But I was sort of thinking, now what? You know, I felt like I did that uh, and I wanted to do something where I felt like I had a lot of friends, including my own clients, tell me that a lot of my talents were being underutilized being a lawyer and that I should definitely go pursue something where they were better utilized to build something, whether a business, an industry. Um, and it sort of inadvertently led me to what I'm doing now. Yeah. So ending up at, at Enchain is kind of the perfect next phase. How did that process uh, come about? So, uh, in short, uh, the, uh, there used to be a company as part of the Enchain group that was a client of mine. It actually predated Enchain. It was a business in Canada that we've actually now since wound down. It was the fintech business that was exploring virtual currencies to improve the international remittance process. And I had been their lawyer for a, a, a while. Um, I was aware of the plans to have Craig move from Australia to uh, the UK and set up what is the Enchain business. I was doing some assistance behind the scenes before the Enchain business emerged publicly. And as part of that, you know, you have conversations with your clients sometimes and um, the question came up, hey, Jimmy, would you be interested in, you know, leaving your nice, comfy, stable, normal corporate law life to work with us at Enchain. <laughs> and so uh, it uh, was uh, um, not really what I was expecting. I got asked, and at first, my first reaction is, I don't think I'm the right person. Um, you know, maybe you should find someone else. Mm -hmm. And um, we kept having conversations about it. And I finally said, it's fine. It's time to take a leap of faith. And off I went. So what was it that made you end up taking, taking a leap? Do you remember anything about that moment or kind of what you learned to make you go ahead first? Sure. I mean, it was, it was definitely a process and a conversation because one, you know, the end chain of business was being set up in London. I didn't necessarily want to move to London. So my first thought was, well, how's this going to work? Right. And, you know, we talked about it and said, you know, that's, that's fine. We, we actually need someone who can assist from the U S and given the relationships I had with technology businesses, particularly in the U S that could become, um, users of Enchain's uh, IP portfolio in the future, that was a value. Um, the fact that I was an IP lawyer was definitely one of the things that led to the conversation. Because as we all know now, Enchain um, started with a path to build a very sophisticated and large patent portfolio in, in the blockchain world. And part of the conversation that we had was, you know, finding someone to understand that and figure out how to uh, leverage that into a commercialization plan, right? Because you can have a lot of patents and a big IP portfolio, but you need to do something with them that creates business opportunities. Um, that started the conversation. And then, of course, there was the intrigue of the Craig Wright story, right? I, you know, um, this, the conversations were happening, you know, a bit around the before and then shortly after the time of, you know, when the Wired magazine and you know, other articles were coming out that essentially were trying to out Craig at the time, this was, I'd say, late 2015. Um, and I knew about the intrigue around Craig. Um, certainly, that's very fascinating, right? If you have, and, and I didn't know what to make, to, what to make of, of it completely at first, because on the one hand, there's this opportunity to work with who may or may not be, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, secret creator of Bitcoin. And then you have to grapple with how do you feel about that? Right? Am I doing it for that reason or am I doing it because I believe in this bigger vision of what Bitcoin can be? So we had a lot of conversations about that. Well, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And was I interested in doing that? And if we go back to you know, my career history, I started working in law at the early days of the internet. And I had opportunities to go work with some dot-com startups. So I didn't take them. And now here I am 20 some years later, having the opportunity to work at this next major technology leap that has you know, a lot of similarities to the early days of the internet. And it was an opportunity to work at a company right in the very center of it with Craig, who we believe is Satoshi and certainly you know, recognized that he is today. And so um, you combine all those ingredients together, it's a 
you know, uh, scarily attractive combination um, to, you know, pull someone like me who was used to a very, you know, good, stable, comfy professional life, right? Um, but it also made me take a step back and ask a life question. You know, I was, um, you know, in my early 40s at the time and said, okay, if you're not going to take a big leap of faith now, when are you going to do it? It's hard to imagine you in the, you know, just having known you since this leap of faith in the stable, cushy corporate, corporate environment for so long. It seems like you're in your element now. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I, I am and I, um, in, in some ways, but I also realized that I look back in time. Well, first of all, when I decided to join Enshape, I did not think I was walking into um, a life where I would be leading, you know, battles over the soul of Bitcoin. <laughs> Right. <laughs> come into, right, as, as we all know in hindsight. Um, so nothing could have prepared me for that fully. Um, I, um, I think that my personality and experience, though, sort of bring a stabilizing force to what we're trying to do. Uh, I recognize we are trying to push the envelope. We are a provocative force in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency world because of, you know, what we're trying to do and Craig Wright's participation. Um, and, you know, I try to provide some steady hands to lead that in, in the best possible way for the benefit of our so, 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 but I, I, so I'm, I'm an interesting mix of, um, of trying to be thoughtful and uh, stabilizing with, you know, being bold. I was also the kind of lawyer who never quite fully fit into big corporate law firms. Yeah. I can be successful them, but personality wise, I was like, mm, I don't really belong here either. <laughs> right. You, you mentioned, you know, in retrospect, your understanding of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular is now quite different from initially when you were working um, with IP and, and stuff for these different companies. I'm curious, like, was that, I feel like that's a common, you know, a common story for people in BSV Bitcoin now who kind of had to do this rethinking process. Was that like a very, because you kind of ended up in the belly of the beast at Enchain. Was that um, like, what was that process like? How did you, you know, how did you uh, rethink from a legal context, your understanding of the technology and how it interacts with the, uh, the business ecosystem? Well, frankly, it was sitting in a lot of conversations, meetings, and ongoing discussions with Craig and then other people at Enchain. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, I used to sit in conversations and think, what the heck are they talking about? Right. Like, you know, it's it's a hard field to understand. And I've learned a lot of different technology fields over the course of my, you know, professional life. It's the hardest one that I've had to learn, um, not just, you know, for the technical um, subject matter, the big shift, which I think people in the BSV ecosystem understand better than anyone else in cryptocurrency is the shift away from thinking of Bitcoin just as a money alternative, because that's what the rest of the world thinks about it. Yes, right, because that's right. how it was introduced to the world. It's a new way to send money, to pay for things, right? It's magic internet money. Um, and I think how most people come into this world of blockchain and cryptocurrency, you know, they, they think of that as well. And so that was what I had to get my head around, um, especially as I was trying to understand the impact of the inventions being created by Craig in, in the uh, NChain IP portfolio, right? What is this all going to be used for one day? What is its impact going to be in the business and commercial world? Um, and then understanding why the scaling debates were impeding that. Understanding why Craig would get so frustrated and frankly angry at that time over why Bitcoin was not scaling. Remember, this was before the introduction of segregated witness, right, into uh, BTC. There were still, you know, these ongoing discussions and debates about what to do about the block size. Um, in the beginning, I kept thinking, okay, this is an interesting technical conversation. Uh, now I understand so much better why the scaling of Bitcoin is necessary, why returning to its original protocol is necessary to unleash a lot of its inherent technical power, and why you know, we shouldn't have had this world of a thousand cryptocurrencies, and it should have just been Bitcoin all along. Um, and it happened, and now we're trying to sort of turn history to a new direction. Um, but I think that was sort of some of my early aha moments in realizing, ah, Bitcoin is more than just electronic cash. It's so much more. So I imagine when you went over to Enchain, you had most of these 
opinions fully or close to fully formed. Um, yet they they really needed you, and I and I imagine you had probably some differing opinions on how to structure their patent portfolio than what they were doing. Uh, I know I'm sure you can't speak to a lot of that, but something I think us and a lot of our listeners in the BSV community are interested in was kind of the work you did in terms of you know taking taking your learnings as an intellectual property lawyer into Enchain uh, and not just you know accomplishing the continued goals, but what did, what did Jimmy bring to, to end chain and what did, what did you see then? You know, that's a hard thing to answer. Can you have to look at yourself from, you know, the outside? Well, what did I bring to end chain at the time? Um, I mean, I think one was the necessary question. What is going to be the business value and use of the IP portfolio? Um, how does that affect, uh, and we had those conversations, you know, Craig has, so many ideas, inventions, concepts coming out of his head. Um, if you, you know, as large as that IP portfolio has grown, grown to today, it could be much larger, right? And so one of the early conversations to have is, do we need to file a patent application on everything? Or how do we focus um, the uh, portfolio to things that are going to have the best business impact or industry impact? Because patent portfolios are expensive. For anyone who's you know had to file them, they, they cost money, especially given the scale that uh, Enchain is doing. And so I think I introduced that conversation um, in my early days at Enchain um, because eventually I was one of the people who was going to be a representative of the company at the time to talk to other businesses about use of Enchain's IP right and technology portfolio. So then it needs to have a value to other businesses. So you have to start thinking about that question, which is, do I, you know, you could file patent applications out of everything coming out of Craig's head, but is it worth it? What's going to be the business value? Is it going to have an industry impact that is going to be beneficial? Um, and then how would we monetize that? Because at the end of the day, Enchain is a private business, right? It, um, it has shifted into a role of a leader of this new BSV ecosystem, but uh, it starts started as and continues to be a private business. So you know, having a uh, a revenue path is always important. So I think I introduced that conversation. Um, I think I also focused a lot of time in my early days on trying to understand Craig and trying to help get his message heard and understood better. That's because um, he has a lot as the world now has seen, has so much to say. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I've taken my steps, it's not just me, um, but he's done really well with it, I think, over the last couple of years. Um, in, I've looked for ways to help his message be better understood. Yeah, I think you've been very successful at that too. I think of you as, you know, Enchain, I think of you as the Bitcoin Association, and I think of you as the Craig Wright translator also. Um, and definitely- yeah, I, I've been, I haven't said that. Someone said to me once, look, you're like the Craig Wright whisperer. Right. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily true. I think he's, he's certainly absorbed, absorbed and learned from me as well as I have from him. I've learned an incredible amount from him. Um, and the biggest thing I learned with Craig is to not change him. A lot of people want to come in and say, oh, Craig, you should give your speeches like this. Or you should write like this. And, you know, I, I used to be a college speech and debate coach, actually, um, after mm -hmm. years of competing myself. And one of the things I learned from years of coaching speech students was in the beginning, especially if you're a successful speaker, like I was a you know, national champion speaker when I was in college. So your first instinct is, oh, I'm going to get someone to deliver the speech like I would. And then you, after years of coaching, I realized you can't do that you have to make someone the best version of themselves. Um, and that's the thing I learned most about Craig, which is don't try to change him. Um, one time I remember having a conversation with him about one of the speeches he was gonna give. And you know, I try to give him simple suggestions. Themes, Craig, themes are good and important. People remember themes, mm -hmm. right? You give a lot of technical information. What's the theme you want people to remember? And we were not going to make Craig Bitcoin Oprah, <laughs> That's me, you know, I'm, I'm much more positive and friendly and hopeful and inspirational. And, and he's never gonna be that. He'll never be comfortable in that role. And I had an epiphany where I said to him, you know what, you're the person who still can deliver a positive message, but you're gonna do it in a way that dares people. You like to challenge people. 
You like to get in their face. So go with that. Dare people to dream of a bigger Bitcoin. And he gave a few speeches about that. Um, and so a lot of my early time at Enchain was getting to know, work with, and understand Craig and what he was trying to achieve, what he was trying to say, what he was trying to accomplish with technology, with the Bitcoin network generally, and then figure out how to translate that to have his message better heard and to filter how that affected Enchain's business decisions. So shifting gears a little bit, Jimmy, uh, we've written some pieces on AML D5, FATFA, mm -hmm. FinCEN, a lot of these, you know, all the acronyms. Yeah, all the, all the all the acronyms. Um, actually, I mean, Dave, Dave is the one who, who really authored these pieces. And uh, but, you know, in, internally, um, kind of before some of these recommendations for the last year came out, we always felt there's, you know, a pretty significant, you know, legal and regulatory risk to, you know, crypto assets whose, uh, you know, one of their main functions is like laundering money, helping people escape capital controls. And then we saw, you know, recommendations that in our view, uh, really seriously condemn this with, you know, actionable timelines uh, to start condemning this. So I uh, get a bit of a leading question, but, you know, uh, we, we think that this is something that's very important and that frankly hasn't really been covered uh, in a serious way by anyone with a strong legal mind. We've done our best to research it, but uh, even with the VSP community, there's not that much written about it. And I imagine you've thought deeply about this. So what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, uh, some of this and how it's going to affect the, the landscape? Uh, my simple thought is it's about time. Um, I know the cryptocurrency world's early days were led by cypherpunks and crypto anarchists and some people who just, you know, believe they're very you know, libertarian leaning. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think people are fully entitled to their own uh, opinions. Um, I, and it's not just because I'm a former lawyer, um, you know, I got interested in this world and decided to take my leap of faith to join Enchain and Bitcoin and I'll do what I'm doing now because I wanted to see Bitcoin and blockchain technology grow to mass global usage, just like the internet did. I've witnessed one major technology cycle in my lifetime. I'm trying to help build the next one. I know from my experience in the internet that it was similar to how cryptocurrencies grown up. In the early days, a lot of companies and government agencies were scared of the internet, right? A lot of gray market activity or questionable activity happened in the internet. Um, a lot of early technologies adopted by fringe industries. And the internet grew into a global technology platform once major businesses and governments got comfortable with it. So the lesson of what you have listed now with things like uh, AMLD5 and the FATFA you know, guidance coming out is just the natural evolution of the fact, a recognition that this technology is here to stay. But I applaud it because governments and big businesses will only feel comfortable using cryptocurrency and blockchain technology if they feel like it can be managed. Um, if risks of money laundering and terrorism financing can be contained. So cryptocurrency got an early reputation because of things like Silk Road for illegal activity. And we are combating that to this day, right? It is why it's difficult for crypto startups, which your firm is going to be investing in, to get bank accounts. It's why it's difficult for blockchain businesses to get insurance. And that inhibits growth of the industry, right? It's why it's hard to get institutional investors interested. Some are here or there, but they, they, you know, they do it very um, with a lot of great caution. So if we want to see a day where Bitcoin ventures, Bitcoin as a blockchain, Bitcoin as a currency alternative is used widely, then we have to live in the real world. And that means complying with the laws of this, not just the United States, but all over the world. Um, that means complying with KYC and AML compliance. And so uh, I wish it had happened sooner. Someone like me who spends a lot of my time going out and talking to government agencies, big businesses, institutional investors, which I'm doing on behalf of the Bitcoin SV ecosystem now, would, that makes my life easier. I can't tell you how many times I walk into meetings and one of the first questions I get is, well, that all sounds great what you're doing with Bitcoin SV, but isn't this all like a place for illegal activity? 
We right. don't want to have to have those conversations anymore. It will make everything we do easier. I know some people don't like it because it means that exchanges now in Europe have to do full KYC and AML compliance and some people complaining about it. I say tough. It's about time. You know, do you want the real world using cryptocurrency? If you say the answer is yes, and you don't want it to be just a fringe industry operating in the shadows. It's about time. So how receptive are these, you know, big institutional investors or regulators when you come to them with this, you know, this idea of like, okay, Bitcoin is actually intended to be compliant. It was designed with that in mind. And here's the reason why. Is that a long conversation where you have to get bogged down in technicalities or is that something that's somewhat intuitive to them once you lay it out? Uh, no, it's a long conversation because first of all, um, you have to explain why is there more than one Bitcoin. <laughs> that's how right. long in and of itself. Secondly, I explain why the Bitcoin SV and Satoshi vision envisions Bitcoin as this much broader technology platform, right? Um, that's not intuitive to people. Um, and then third, I explain to them that we have ideas for how um, Bitcoin is traceable, can be um, uh, the thing that has oversight by government agencies, law enforcement agencies, you know, big businesses from an institutional investor standpoint. That's not intuitive to them as, at all because what they've heard is Bitcoin can't be traced. It's anonymous. It is, that's why criminals use it. I hear that all the time and I have to make the explanation. Well, the ledger was designed to be transparent. It's an open public ledger. And while it's pseudonymous, it's not anonymous. And there are ways that uh, Bitcoin transactions can be traced that help combat crime and reduce problematic behavior. That's not intuitive to them at all. For all of us who work in this field, that's obvious. But that's a huge point of education that has to be done. Um, I would say the law enforcement agencies are more familiar with it. I had a week I spent in Washington, D.C. last October, including talking with some government agencies. Um, and so they, they are more in tune to that. But uh, I would say a lot of the rest of the world is not. What are some of the biggest obstacles you think that is stopping, you know, major institutional investors from putting in serious capital to, you know, either Bitcoin SV, the asset or into the ecosystem, you know, through other, other means? Um, I think one is there's the f fear of, of volatility. Um, some aren't that afraid of it. It gives them obviously an opportunity for appreciation. But um, I think institutional investors that are investing themselves are willing to take the risks and holding some cryptocurrency in their portfolio. But when they're managing funds and managing other people's money, I think that is where there is fear, right? They don't... Um, uh, I think they're afraid of regulatory risk. There is the question all the time I have to answer, is Bitcoin SV a covered security or not? Does it fit into the commodity box, right? Um, so after the ICO craze and the crackdown by regulatory agencies on unregistered security offerings through tokens, there's uh, the question about whether any token is a security. One is whether it can be used for illegal activity. Uh, you know, what is being built on it that's legitimate? People ask a lot about that. Um, and uh, I, the other concern, honestly, is that crypto businesses, you know, as I said, have these problems with banking, with getting insurance, and so people are a little skittish. Um, they also are sometimes waiting to see whether their government agencies are going to, you know, crack down somehow. And anytime something news comes out of China, people, you know, will say, well, didn't China ban, you know, Bitcoin? I'm like, well, no, not really. I know there's a perception of that. Um, I think, so bottom line is, I think some institutional investors are definitely um, making investments in holding cryptocurrency, but I think the um, funds that manage pools of money, including third party money, I think they are definitely uh, having more concerns because they don't want to walk into an area where they have third party money uh, invested in an asset which is in a gray zone. Do you, do you think that MLD5 and FATFA guidance is that kind of assurance that the, and that like come June or, or starting in January with MLD5, is that kind of the, uh, you know, releasing the bulls and everyone can, can go build it in confidence? I think that definitely helps because it will obviously um, 
create more oversight and clean of exchanges to prevent things like wash trading, for example, and um, money laundering on exchanges. But I think it's going to take more than that. So for example, I think people want to know, does particularly the U.S. lead government agencies like the SEC and the CFTC, do they consider this digital asset a commodity mm -hmm. or possibly a covered security that needs to be registered? That's a key question for institutional investors, right? Because, you know, it's a question that haunts Ripple, right? It's a question that's starting to loom over Ethereum these days. Um, and so in, institutional investors will definitely feel a lot more comfortable if something is neatly in the commodity box. Um, and that is a challenging thing because regulatory agencies usually don't like to come out and offer a clean opinion about that. Right. So you've spoken a little bit kind of broadly in terms of like what institutional investors need to see to invest in cryptocurrency and blockchain. And presumably, you know, as it becomes more clear that there is, you know, uh, one chain that is by far, you know, uh, more scaled currently and has greater potential to scale than others and is, you know, more legally compliant than all the others, they'll be more comfortable with, you know, Bitcoin SV specifically. Um, but, um, like how much of institutional investors investing in BSV itself, not just crypto and blockchain, how much, you know, blood in the street, so to speak, within crypto, broadly speaking, do they need to see? Is that even a good thing for them? Like, I, I, I echo your points in terms of, you know, what we're going to need to see to see, you know, every investor have some percentage of their asset allocation in BSV. But I think, you know, in between where we are now and there, there are going to be some institutional investors that, you know, take some reputational risk before many others and make outsized returns as a result. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's probably some catalyst for that. And, you know, as investors ourselves, uh, we're looking to bring in more institutional capital into the space. And uh, from my experience, there's a lot of varied concerns in terms of what it's going to take to get people to put serious capital in Bitcoin SV community. If, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, what would it be to have those kind of, you know, higher, higher risk institutional investors to put money in BSV? What's going to make that happen? So I guess if, 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 if we all, if we knew, you know, that that's yeah. the, that's the multi-billion dollar question, but. Yeah. I mean, uh, there yeah, are the, there are the institutional investors who are willing to do it or, to, take a risk early, right? And suffer the reputational risk. Um, frankly, institutional investors want, they're willing to take some risk, but they want credibility. And it's why I, along with a lot of our team members have been working very hard this year to raise the credibility of Bitcoin SV in the outside crypto world um, by informing people about its enterprise level usage and why we need to win the battle for cryptocurrency with facts, with um, technical success, right? Walking around just talking about Bitcoin SV, it's possible to do this, um, doesn't get past a lot of the questions that we face. That's why seeing transaction volume increase um, on the BSV network and overtaking BTC and periodically overtaking Ethereum is really compelling. It's why the rapid explosion of BSV app development that I can point to with the number of projects, apps, and ventures out there. And um, that's compelling. It's why some upcoming larger business and enterprise uses of the BSC blockchain are and will be compelling. Um, I think institutional investors want to see uh, a credible asset. And uh, I've been working very hard to take measures to reinforce the credibility of Bitcoin SV. Yeah, I think what you mentioned earlier about just the mindset shift from this is a digital money to this is an internet protocol that contains value is huge. And just from our experience, um, you know, with, with raising money and investing in, in BSP startups, it's been great to move from the former, which is, you know, it was amazing. I didn't see it in 2009, but it was probably amazing to see in 2009. But now when you see it, you're like, well, you know, I have Venmo or, you know, you have a similar experience, even though the back end is quite different, but now we can show, you know, these applications that are built and um, people can understand it as just an internet upgrade rather than, you know, a, a money application. Yeah, I think that is a really key part of our message. And, you know, I'm not going to name names, but I'm just going to say I have sat in the room with some of, you know, 
leading names in <laughs> finance and blockchain and crypto investment world, some you know, very notable people. And it is somewhat shocking how little uh, some know about Bitcoin and what it's capable of doing. Um, I think it's easy in our world for people who come at it from a pure investment. Is the price going up, down, what are the trends, right? To get locked into these very simple narrative message points. Oh, Bitcoin's now a store of value. Oh, you know, Ethereum, that's the programmable money over there, smart contract. It's like everyone talks in these buzz phrases. Right. Uh, and I get it because it's a hard field to pay attention to in detail. And so, um, you know, we have to, and we're working on that every day to have short form ways to describe what we're doing, right? Because people don't really have so much attention span. But I think that shift from understanding Bitcoin as just an electronic cash um, system, or it's just a money alternative to a technology platform that powers, as we like to say, it can power everything, is really important. And that's where I think I attract the attention of institutional investors when I get in a room with them or major enterprises, because they see the bigger potential. They see the longer term potential. Um, as opposed to just the chance for, you know, a quick price escalation. Um, uh, so that's why, how I try to pique their interest. You're investing in the next, as and it, a good way, next internet upgrade. And from our experience, it's been amazing just opening up the potential um, audience for that, right? So you can move from just speculators or you can move from just um, maybe like libertarian minded people that would understand sure. a sound money pitch. And now you're just talking to, to technologists and you say, Bingo. here are some issues with the internet and this is the solution. And just reframing it, it just, you know, opens up a whole world. Yeah, which is why I actually don't, I try to spend less and less time talking to crypto and blockchain audiences and media. Right. Yeah. In my view, I don't say they're irrelevant. They're just not going to carry the day, right? We right. are talking to technology builders. Um, it's why it's also important for me to have, you know, I get asked a lot of the time, you know, are these startups in the BSV world that you're looking at, that we're looking at, are they making a difference? Look, let's be honest, they're all not going to become the great, you know, successful businesses of tomorrow. Hopefully a lot of them will, but what they provide me are good proof of concepts to talk with institutional investors about. It's why we have been pushing to get some bigger business use of the BSV blockchain. Um, because that is the kind of thing that is much easier to explain to institutional investors. And so there will be some announcements coming up in the next couple of weeks before and uh, hopefully also at CoinGeek London on that front that I'm really excited for the Bitcoin SV Society to hear about because it really helps me because one of the questions I get asked all the time from the institutional investor community is what businesses are using BSV? Right. And to date, we haven't had major enterprises and that's okay we've had a year of building the technology infrastructure and platform and scaling and doing the work that's necessary it's wonderful and we love that one store out in korea became sort of the first major business to take a stab at building a bsv application with its buscon music content delivery service um there's going to be some more coming and that is going to be where i think the shift happens to really get the attention of institutional investors um, when more of these larger businesses, they don't have to be the you know, biggest businesses in the world, but when you have more solid, credible businesses building uh, on BSV, that I think is where we're going to be able to make a really significant shift. And that's where my attention is focused on right now and for the rest of the year. So, so I imagine with your you know, legal background and background in startups and business, you probably have a lot of ideas about how, you know, certain aspect of legal process could be aided by Bitcoin. Sure. Uh, you know, what different types of law tech are you excited about seeing in the near future being built on BSV? And, you know, what ideas for our, you know, builders listening to this should people go out and start working on? Yeah, I actually just last week was in Charleston, South Carolina, um, speaking at a summit of an insurance company um, with it and its global you know, law firms and, and lawyers are across the world uh, talking exactly about this. How can blockchain technology um, change law as well as the insurance industry? So if I were an aspiring entrepreneur and wanted to build uh, some legal tech business using the BSV blockchain, some things that are really useful are uh, a blockchain-based intellectual property registry. You know, people hear about um, um, land 
property registries being created on you know blockchain um, i think ip and other intangible assets would be really well served by a registry system it's really difficult to be able to uh, accurately trace ip assets in the us we have the us patent office and the us trademark office and they have records and you can you know definitely um, track things on there but it could be really especially the global system would receive a lot of benefit from an ip registry People talk about creating smart contract systems. Um, I think you know, they're not gonna replace lawyers, replace the legal system because smart contracts are only really useful, frankly, for fairly dumb contracts, things that are very, have repeatable, discrete if then actions, right? If what X happens, you know, $500 gets paid into this Bitcoin wallet, right? right. Um, so, uh, but I think someone, if they created a, a application that made it easy to translate because you have to take a human contract, a human agreed contract, you and I agree on a contract, we might write it down into a human written, um, uh, written agreement, but to then translate that into smart contract code, someone needs to create a s solution for that, right? To make it easier for the lawyers and business of the world to take existing contracts by certain types, things that are, you know, forms, repeatable, um, purchase orders, tenant leases, right? Uh, uh, car lease payment agreements, right? Which are repeatable and convert that to smart contract code. Um, I uh, think that insurance policies can be automated in some way with respect to claims forms. There are certain types of insurance which would benefit from smart contracts. For example, nobody likes to buy travel insurance because no one wants to go through the claim process in case you have to make a claim. But, you know, an example I like to give in speeches to lawyers is what if you could create a uh, travel insurance policy that is automated on blockchain where I pay, let's say, $25 for insurance to um, give me a uh, payment um, to cover my time and possible costs if my flight is more than four hours late, right? And, um, and if I, my flight is more than four hours late, I get $200 as, um, as the claim payment. But I don't have to submit the claim if you can have oracles or some other source of information feed to a smart contract performing on a blockchain the time when my flight lands from, let's say, the FAA um, information that provides publicly available information about flights. And if my flight is more than four hours late, which is a very if it happens or no, it doesn't happen um, uh, criteria, then I get $200 paid to my Bitcoin wallet automatically. Um, you could do the same things with like builders of insurance, which um, is triggered, for example, by weather conditions. If you're doing construction um, and you have to deliver construction completion by a certain date, but you want protection for weather delays. If it rains too much, then you won't be able to do your construction. You could do that by monitoring weather data, including, for example, by drawing from data marketplaces like Weather SV and calculate the number of inches of rain that happened during construction period and use that to determine whether an automated claim payment um, can happen on a constructor's uh, construction insurance policy, for example. So those are the kinds of things that I think the, can affect the legal as well as related industries like insurance. Um, it's to automate processes that have recording of information, uh, registries, contracts that have very discrete performance criteria, um, and in addition, um, people talk about this a lot, you know, there's notarization um, of, of documents or confirmation of documents existence, which can help in evidentiary battles, um, which happen sometimes where you want to confirm the existence of a document in a certain form, right? That, you know, a document, because documents change. Um, this becomes issues uh, in litigation, as we've seen in, you know, certain litigation that might be prominent in the BSV world these days, where people will fight over whether a document has been changed or not at certain points in time. So for important documents, you can definitely have um, BSV blockchain-based systems, which will um, confirm the, the identity of a document, um, as well as, you know, its uh, contents. I, you see <clears throat> I love the, the explanation or the example of the travel insurance. And while you're explaining that, I was having like PTSD flashbacks to my Ethereum interest days. And the big question there would be, well, how do we remove all human contact from the system? How do we have a decentralized Oracle? And they would just, you know, rack their heads around that. And I, I really hope that, you know, 
we could even just clip this part of the interview. I want people that are working in Ethereum that have really good ideas that are bogged down in these really technical problems that are based on this code is law mentality to understand that, you know, things like that are possible. You don't need to have this like technical solution to the Oracle problem. And you can build these contracts today on Bitcoin SV and, you know, something like that would be amazing as someone that travels, you know, I would love to have uh, a travel insurance contract like that. Yeah. And it would probably lead to insurance companies selling more insurance, which they yeah. want. They want new alternate products to generate revenue. More people would probably do it if they knew they could get an automated claims payment and have to go through the drama of, you know, claim submission. Um, and I think you raise another interesting point, which is, you know, this question about removing the human element from everything. I think that's such a misguided view of what blockchain technology is. Yes, it can automate a lot, but it doesn't change the fact that all business and payment and other interactions are between people. Right. Companies are too, are run by people. It, blockchain technology should not be replacing human activity interactions. It can make it more efficient. Right, yeah, it was such a aha moment for, for me personally and just opened up so many opportunities when I just realized, oh, law is law, duh. And in retrospect, yeah. it's so silly, yeah. but. It's, uh, well, you know, people used to say this, you know, you're probably too young to remember this, but like when the internet first came out, people used to think, oh, does the law apply to the internet? Right. Now, if you were to ask that question today, people would laugh at you, right? Like, of course it does, right? Things, activity that happens on the internet are clearly subject to, um, you know, uh, the laws of all the different jurisdictions around the world. We've seen that in the copyright context. We've seen it with tax, right? We've seen it um, with sale of illegal activities, explosives on the internet. Um, you know, so you've seen it on a lot of different things. And so the same is going to happen with blockchain and cryptocurrency. Just because it happens in this virtual sense that we don't physically see doesn't mean it's not subject to law because the actors, the companies and people who operate on the technology platform, we are all subject to law. Right. Um, so Jimmy, you mentioned that uh, you might have some uh, snippets or previews of what you might be announcing around Genesis or at CoinGeek regarding the developer ecosystem in BSV. Uh, what can our listeners and about it at Unbounded Conversations hear before the, you know, the big announcements? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so first of all, we're super excited about CoinGeek London, February 20th to 21st. For those of you who haven't got your tickets, now's the time to get them. And Zach, I'm sorry, you can't be there. So we're gonna have yeah, to- Some of my best friends just had to get married right then. I know. Very rare. Yeah. Sorry you can't <laughs> be there. Um, but it's gonna be obviously a great historic moment for us. It's just a couple of weeks after the Genesis hard fork, which is coming up soon, just next week uh, as we're filming this. Um, so uh, without you know revealing everything, um, one of the big initiatives I have this year through Bitcoin Association is to answer the call and demand by people around the world saying, hey, we need more developer training, developer resources and support. There are all these developers who um, want to learn to build on Bitcoin SV. There's developers we want to attract from other ecosystems like Ethereum and EOS, right? Um, so we um, want to, uh, we're going to be launching programs and content, which we'll announce at CoinGeek London to support that. We'll have a series of events across the year. Uh, we will have um, educational content and material that we'll talk about at CoinGeek London. So I want the world out there to know we recognize this. I've gotten a lot of requests about this over the last years because there are some people who sort of figure it out on their own, but we want to make this as easy and welcoming as possible. So we have a very big set of initiatives to support developer training, education, and support um, for developers across the world to get them building on Bitcoin SV. Um, with that said, we also long-term, working with the Enchain team, want to create a world where people don't really need to know about all of the under the hood Bitcoin programming and coding difficulties to build on Bitcoin. You're seeing businesses in our world already doing that. Handcash just announced, you know, today, you know, the launch of its Handcash Connect SDK to make it easy for other apps and websites to integrate Bitcoin SV payments. So that if you're another business, you could start operating with Bitcoin SV without having to do all that. Um, I think we're gonna move to that world. Um, and like we've seen on the internet, right? A lot of functions that happen underneath don't require other app developers or businesses to know about IP protocol. 
right? Someone else is taking care of, uh, taking care of that problem. So um, expect to hear some stuff about developer initiatives, expect to hear some exciting um, business announcements about some business use of Bitcoin SV. Some of it will hopefully may even be announced before the conference as a preview to what you'll hear at the conference. Um, obviously, we're super excited about our two keynote speakers, which we've announced, Tom Lee from Fundstrat, who's obviously a famed Wall Street analyst, uh, and George Gilder. Um, you know, uh, Craig and I are super excited for George Gilder, famed economist and uh, best-selling author to come talk because, you know, Craig mentioned this when, you know, that all happened, I'll tell you the story, where Craig and I were at, uh, you, know, a, you know, we were at events in Beijing last, you know, just in December, just a little over a month ago, and we were at this big technology conference, the TH conference and its awards, and we're at the awards dinner before everyone sits down, and then Craig looks over it and says, is that George Gilder over there? And I turn around, I'm like, oh, Okay, and then Greg walks over and starts talking to him. And you know, as Craig will say, you know, George really inspired a lot of Craig's thinking about Bitcoin as a data, you know, commodity that has value, right? Which is a lot of similar to a lot of what George is writing as well. So we're super excited to have George come speak. So those are some of the exciting things you can expect. But um, you know, for the people who are looking to build out there, uh, we'll be announcing a series of initiatives to support developer training and, uh, you know, curriculums. And I think one of those announcements will be a co-announcement of ours over the coming months, so. Oh, so. yeah, that could be. If, 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 that, if, we, if that gets sorted out, we, we might be announcing that before CoinGeek, so stay well, tuned, world. We're, we're gonna make something happen. Yeah, yeah, we'll make something happen. Yeah, no, we're partnering with a lot of things around the world. So there's a lot going on, which is why I and our team are, you know, super crazy busy these days. Yeah. But, um, as I say to them sometimes, well, we could not be busy because nobody cares about working on our blockchain. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, good problem. Yeah. Well, uh, Jimmy, on that note, uh, you've been very generous with your time. And I know you have a lot of things to build, a lot of people to inspire. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you go now, but, uh, we both really appreciate you coming on to, to the podcast. And as always, it's a pleasure, pleasure talking, talking with you. Ah, uh, good to talk to you, Zach and Dave. I will see you in London. Yep. See you soon. Coat and a scarf. What's that? <laughs> a coat and a scarf. Oh yeah. Will do. Will do. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and thank you for, you know, what you all are doing to really contribute to the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. I say thank you to all of the early believers. Um, I, I think we will look back in hindsight and history in some years and it'll all seem so obvious, but for those who are willing to believe and to take a leap of faith and to help the push early on to drive BSV to what we believe it can accomplish, I always say thank you. Jimmy, you can't help but be motivational. <laughs> Bitcoin Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. Okay.